are live. So hello, everyone. Good to see you. Tad here. Um, and it is 7 o'clock on Sunday here in Northern California, which, as I have frequently explained, is actually the middle of California. But we have this technicality where anything that isn't a major metropolitan center doesn't count. So because there aren't any major metropolitan centers north of San Francisco, they consider San Francisco to be Northern California. Go figure. Anyway, other than that, that, uh, that pro megalopolis sympathy, um, the rest of Northern California is very, very beautiful and well worth visiting. And there are certainly people living there and cities and things like that. So don't ever be discouraged. Um, in fact, some of the nicest parts of the state are north of us here. Um, the Redwood Groves and Mount Shasta and all kinds of cool things. So anyway, um, as most of you know, or not, yeah, probably most of you who are tuning in if you're following my social media and stuff, we had the, the sad but necessary duty of a funeral for my dad yesterday, which um, of course was not anything that any of us wanted to do, but on the other hand, he was a very good guy and uh, he deserved a proper send off, which I hope we gave him. And uh, as you can expect, I'm a bit overwhelmed. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been a, a bizarre, bizarre year in so many ways and I didn't think I'd be saying that again after after the pandemic which kind of set the standards for bizarre but then you know in the last 12 months I've lost two parents and one honorary parent a very dear family friend who was the mom of my best friend and who I used to consider my second mom and uh, it's just been a bit of an overwhelming last 12 months also in the middle of that because of these changes in life. Um, Deborah and I moved down over the hill to Palo Alto uh, to, in part, to take care of this house and various other things. And, uh, you know, so we're not exactly sure what we're going to be doing next or how we're going to be doing it. Um, to the extent that it's of interest to anybody, I will keep you apprised. Um, but in the mean, meantime, we are just continuing to do the things that need to be done, which in my case consists of reading and writing. So I am not going to be writing tonight, <laughs> um, but I am doing that whenever the chance presents itself. And uh, I am going to be reading, however, and we are going to be continuing with the uh, Brothers of the Wind. So just in case you were wondering, that's what's going to happen in just a few minutes. I don't really, I kind of shot my bolt last night in terms of explaining my feelings about everything and my philosophy, such as it is, uh, such as it is, definitely, um, because I was mainly just talking about how important family is and the fact that family, of course, is not only just, you know, the people that you are genetically related to, but can be, a, you know, a family that you make yourself out of like-minded and convivial souls. Um, what does matter is that that troop, that tribe, that group of support people, um, which has been very important for me in the last year plus. Really very, very important um, for keeping my relative sanity. And um, that's not, a, a, <laughs> that's not a, a, a joke on my relatives. That just means my sanity is at best relative um, at any time. But it is an important thing is to know that, you know, that you have people there who, you know, as the saying is, who have your back. Um, and that doesn't mean it has to be literally a fighting situation, but it does mean you, you need to have people around you for when things get tough who will just listen to you or, you know, sympathize or, you know, if you need it, they'll make suggestions. But if you don't need it, they'll just listen because sometimes what we don't want is suggestions or people trying to help solve our problems. We just need to say, I'm really upset right now, I'm really depressed, or I'm sad, or I'm scared, or, you know, whatever the case may be. So I do feel very strongly about that. Whether your family, whether other people made your family for you, and that it is a genetic entanglement, or whether you made your own family by finding people that were convivial, and uh, with whom you were in sync, um, it's still family, and we all need it. And in a sense, you know, this this whole reading thing in a, in a different way where, you know, I think it's kind of a 
kind of a family type situation in the sense that I've been doing it for a while now, several years. And um, most, most of the people here are kind of getting to know each other, and I've always valued that. I think that's really nice. If I could spend the rest of my life just as somebody connecting other people to each other, um, I would be perfectly happy with that. So um, that's pretty much where I'm at. I don't have a huge amount to say uh, today. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, things will be happening Things will change. Things will uh, surprises will rear their their ugly heads. Um, well, not all of them are necessarily going to be ugly, but you know things will happen. Things will change. That is the nature of the existence that we live. That's what losing people dear to you reminds you that, um, in some senses, that not that life is arbitrary, but that it, it is not controllable. Uh, that the as John Lennon said. Life is what happens when you have other plans. And I think that was one of the wiser things John ever said, um, because that's exactly it. You take things for granted and then, um, you know, a sudden death or an accident or, you know, any number of things, losing a job, getting a new job, you know, I mean, it's not all negatives, but suddenly things happen and cast a large stone into the small pond and the ripples are washing out in all directions and the reflective surface is completely warped and distorted and you realize that you were um, you had major plans on um, a, something that wasn't necessarily stable so that's the other thing then that I would just want to remind people about and you know a lot of these things are just cliches and there's a reason that they're cliches because they are so true and so inarguable that you know, it almost seems like they don't bear saying, but they do because we all forget the very nature of these kinds of clinic, uh, these kind of cliched interactions with life is that we start to treat them like that, you know, like the equivalent of saying thank you or you're welcome or, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff where it's just something that you do and it's not something you really think about. But when it comes to things like, remembering that nothing is, is is given to you forever and nothing is given to you as a guarantee of anything it makes it more important to remember the the small things you know just the the staying in in touch the keeping the the bond strong telling people you love them like i said these are clichés but there's a reason and they are things that we need to remind ourselves of from time to time um and Nothing brings that home for you faster than losing somebody that you thought you were going to have for a while. And even with my aging parents, um, I made miscalculations. You know, there are things that I prioritized that I now wish in retrospect I hadn't or that I had changed those priorities. So, you know, that's all really, that's the only message I have for anybody today is just never take anything for granted when it comes to your loved ones and your life and the things that are important to you because you cannot tell when it's going to change and life is change and mortality is one of the biggest changes of all of course but you know i'm just talking about the physical facts of it whatever else you may think about it is completely up to you and whatever makes you happy is good and uh to quote another rock star as andre 3000 of Outcast once said, uh, whatever floats your boat and finds your lost remote. And I'm a big believer in that too. Make yourself happy. Okay, with that said, let me go see if I can see any of the people who are checking in now. Let's see if we've got commenters, con commenters who have commented so far. Jennifer Rousseau, hello Jennifer. Angie, as always, good to see you. Ray, same for you. And Tim, Speckins, a pleasure. Kelly, hello, Kelly and Emily. As always, uh, you're, you are very welcome. Margaret, also good to see you. Melissa, Melissa Fuller, hang on, it just disappeared on me again. Brad Smith, hello, Brad. Barb Ann, the inimitable Barb Ann and the inimitable Isaac. So, hello, Isaac, Tim, good to see you. Ray, a pleasure, as always. Claudia, hello, hello. Uh, Medardo, Medardo, bienvenido, señor. Um, es un placer de verte. Um, what else are we doing here? Jack Barucha. Hello, Jack. Good to see you. Christy. Also good to see. Darlene. Hello, Darlene. Susan Shamblin. As always, I'm glad to have you with us. And Penny Davies. Same thing. 
And thank you all for all the very, very, oh, and Jeremy is sitting there with his mom. Hi, Jeremy. Good to see you. As you can imagine, things have been a bit crazy here, which is why you haven't heard from us in any other way, shape, or form. So anyway, good to see you all. Um, I don't really have much else to say today other than to, you know, to say thanks for joining me. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, then I'm just going to kind of jump in and start reading because I'm a bit talked out. I actually slept for huge chunks in the last two days, which I think is, you know, just the, the body brain matrix saying, you are exhausted mentally and emotionally. So just give up for a while. And me being me, um, I'm always willing to listen to that advice, <laughs> always. And uh, I, I'm a big firm believer that, you know, when your body is telling you, you're, you're not doing this, you're not up to it, that it's a good idea to listen to it, unless it goes on forever. You know, obviously after a few weeks or something, then, you know, you have to start looking at, well, maybe I'm depressed or whatever the case may be. But if you just had a tough, tough couple of days for whatever reason, as I said, emotionally, physically, whatever, you know, and your body says, don't, don't try to force yourself to do this today. My suggestion is listen, listen to your body. It, it has a reason for saying that. Whether I'm right or wrong, I have no idea. But these are words that I live by and uh, or nap by, as the case may be. Anyway, so hello to everybody who's here. And if I missed you because you hadn't showed up on my thing I have to read off of here for on the Facebook page. Many apologies. You are still just as valued. Um, okay, so let's go back to Brothers of the Wind. So I think, what did we have yesterday that we were, we were dealing with? The, the, um, the brothers had left, uh, this is Hakatri and Inaluki, along with the narrator, who is Hakatri's servant, Paman Kes. They had left the Castle of Raven's Perch, which is the, um, the fortress or the stronghold of a uh, Hikidaya, a Norn exile named Zaniko, um, to whom they had gone for some advice about dragon slaying. And they may have got some. We never saw it specifically. The only thing we know for certain is that um, Hakatri has now said they need a witchwood tree and that he carried away a, a large, strange jug of something and tied it to the saddle of his horse. So that's what that's all we know about what Zaniko uh, contributed to their quest to destroy the dragon Hidohebi. Um, and if you don't remember why they have to destroy the dragon Hidohebi, among other things, it's because it's like a gigantic lizard that's killing people, but also because Inaluki foolishly swore he would never return home until the dragon was dead, you know, which is kind of like saying, I will never return home until... Uh, the Empire State Building has tipped over and fallen. You know, this is like a major deal and you're you're really reducing your chances of getting home anytime in the near future. So that's what was going on. So they left Zaniko. Um, it's just the three of them now. And they stopped at the household of another well-known Sithi, Sitha, um, and Dunyadi. And while they were staying with Dunyadi, they also uh, were visited by uh, Nidreyu, who is the Hakatri's wife, wife's sister. Briseyu is Hakatri's wife, and Nidreyu is her sister, and she's kind of the on-again, off-again love interest of Inaluki. But the two of them were very much on the outs because of this crazy oath that he's made and her anger and upset with him. So that's where they are, and now they are off in search of apparently a witchwood tree, which no one else has to give them, and the only other easy way to get one would be to go back home, which Inalukia said he can't do and won't do. And that's what's going on at the moment, so I'm just going to start reading from this new section from where we stopped, because it was the end of a section. Okay. We rode all that day and late into the evening before stopping in the foothills to rest and feed our mounts. The horses seemed in good health when I looked them over. The worst of the rains had passed and the trees gleamed in the last light of the twilight. As we made our way upward, the sound of dripping water from their branches was all we heard. When we finally halted for the night, the country around us was so quiet we seemed to have entered some other world. Hakatri, and Inaluki did not speak, but sat beside the fire I built from what dry wood I could find. 
My master and his brother did not feel the cold as I did, but there is something reassuring about a fire that even the Zedaya appreciate. We sat together until the star called Nightheart reached its highest point. Then I finally rolled myself in my cloak to snatch some sleep. The next morning found us riding through the uplands that had once been called Azosha's Garden, but which I suppose had been given a new name by its mortal inheritors, Cormac's Hernsman. We began to pass mortal farms and other small holdings, and to see sheep, pigs, and even an occasional cow grazing on the hillsides. As we drew closer to what had been Mien Azoshai, we passed by a number of small settlements. Almost all the mortal men and women stopped what they were doing to watch us pass. They did not look hostile, but neither did they seem particularly welcoming, and although a few made signs of respect as we passed, the brothers' witchwood armor must have made it clear we were no ordinary travelers, most of the mortals watched us with decidedly cautious expressions. We sighted the Hernsman settlement well before we reached it. In late morning, we approached its outer walls, a palisade of tall, sharpened posts. The gate was large, more than twice my height, and built of sturdy oak with massive metal hinges. Racks of antlers had been mounted along the top of it, all taken from what looked to have been uncommonly large deer, and the banner that fluttered above the gate displayed a white stag on a field of bright green. The guards at the gate, shaggy men, wearing matching cloaks of the same grassy hue as their flag, seemed uncertain at first what to do with us. My master conferred with him for a short while. The leader of the guards spoke a little of our tongue, and after a runner was sent up to what the guard called the house and quickly returned, we were allowed in. A small company of gate guards escorted us up the winding track toward the inner walls, but already we were passing clustered dwellings and a few larger wood and stone buildings I took for temples. I do not know much of the gods the mortals worship, but I know there are many of them. The city's inner wall was made of great chunks of stone held together by mortar, which was nothing unusual, but as we were led through the second gate, my master stopped me. See, si, Pama, he said, pointing. It looks like the mortals pulled down Azosha's house to make their fortification. When I looked closer, I saw that the chunks of stone in the wall were no ordinary rocks, that their surfaces were smooth, almost polished, and many were covered in fine carvings. Hakatri shook his head. It is a shame what they have done to your people's work. At the time, I thought he meant only the hard labor of erecting the stones, and I merely nodded. A pity. Some day we will be gone, and all the world will be like this, Inaluki said, but with less heat than I would have expected. Mortal men lie living in the ruins of what we built, as a snake slithers into an abandoned burrow. If you begin talking about abandoned burrows when we are in the mortal court, Hakatri said sourly, I will walk out and leave you there. Turn a blind eye if you wish, said Inaluki. At least the snake waits until the badger is dead before stealing its home. Both badgers and snakes still share the world, if not a single burrow, his brother said. And, in any case, the Hernsmen did not make their dwelling here until after Lady Azosha gave it to them. The city, small as it was, was named Hern's Horn, perhaps because of its antler-festooned gates. I would guess that something like two thousand mortals lived there, although I do not pretend to know. As we mounted the highest hill, we reached the final stone wall and saw within its circuit a sprawling structure of wood, the house. It was larger than Dunyadi's snowdrift, though not by much. Just as I was thinking we would have to wait all over again at the tall front doors, a familiar figure appeared. Lord Hakatri, Lord Ineluki, you are most welcome, cried Prince Cormac. You do our household a great honor. Will you come and meet my grandfather, the king? May we wash ourselves first, my master asked. We have been on the road many days. 
Of course, of course, Cormac said. Come, and we will give you hot water and dry clothes. You have likely heard that mortals hate bathing. I cannot speak for those Naban men in the south or the troll folk of the far north, but we hernsmen are clean people like you. Hakatri smiled, though Inaluki looked a little offended. I am glad to hear it. Thank you. I used my master's tub after he had finished. It was good to get the mud of the road off me and soak the chill out of my bones. When I was out, I helped Hakatri dress in the power of, oops, when I was out, I helped Hakatri dress in the colorful but coarse woven clothing that the hernsmen provided, undergarments of linen and outerwear made from the dyed wool of sheep. When we were ready, Cormac returned and led us into the main hall of the house. There we found at least a score of mortals waiting to see us, mostly thick-bearded males, dressed in furs and heavy wool cloaks, so that we seemed surrounded by animal men. Some of them, I do not doubt, had never seen a Zedaya. They may not have seen my kind either, but it was the brothers they had come to stare at in wonder. The roof was high, and a great fire burned in a stone fireplace at one end of the room. But the house itself was built entirely of oak wood, and I wondered what these mortals would do if it ever caught fire. I discovered later that the wooden houses of the mortals often caught fire. I still do not understand why they would build that way when stony mountains ripe for quarrying surround them. Come, my good lords, and meet my grandfather and my father. Cormac led us across the long high hall amid the wondering stares of his fellow hernsmen. I had never been in the house of a mortal, let alone a mortal king, and I wish now that I had paid more attention to my surroundings. I do remember that many wooden carvings hung on the walls, animals and birds and vaguely manlike shapes, but if I did not look around as carefully as I should have, it was because I was staring at the oldest creature I had ever seen. Rather, I should say, the oldest looking, since, as is the way of the Zedaya, both Hakatri's parents appeared little older than their children or grandchildren. My grandfather, King Gorlach Ugrain, said Cormac, and my father, Rian, Prince of the Coastlands. I hope my astonishment was not too obvious or too impolite, but I had never seen a truly old mortal before. Those who came on embassies to Azua were usually in the prime of their lives, however short those mortal lives might be. But King Gorlach was ancient by the standards of his folk. His hair so thin, his scalp showed through even on the sides, his beard so straggly that it looked like white tree moss. His wrinkled face, to my eyes, was just as much a ruin as any tumbled stone wall of an abandoned dwelling. King Gorlach's limbs were so thin, age-spotted and knotted with veins, that he might have been made out of an animal hide that had been left in the sun for years, and his head bent so low it almost seemed to spring directly from his breastbone. I was so taken by this wreckage of what had doubtless once been a tall, strong, mortal man that I did not for some moments look to Gorlach's son, Cormac's father. When I did, I received another surprise. Prince Rion was a cripple. That was immediate, immediately obvious, and not merely because of the withered arm that he held cradled against his chest like a sleeping child. Rion was handsome for a mortal, like his son, but his head trembled and nodded, and even his good hand quivered when he lifted it to greet us. I could not tell for certain because of the thick clothing he wore, but I thought from the way he sat that one of his legs might also be shrunken and lame as well. It is rare to see the immortals among us. Rian's use of the Zedaya tongue was creditable, although he had no little trouble speaking because of his palsy. Have you come to rid us of this noxious worm? If so, you will all you will have all our g g he paused to compose himself our gratitude. 
he finished. The old king said something in the Hernsland tongue, which to me sounded more of throat-clearing than proper speech. "'My grandfather thinks you have come from Naban,' said Cormach. "'He is a trifle confused today. "'He has days that are good and days that are bad.' "'Cormac replied to his grandfather in the Hernsland tongue, "'and the king leaned forward to listen. "'When Cormac had finished, Gorlach sat back, "'though he appeared to view us with a good deal more suspicion than before. "'Fear not, fair folk,' said Cormac's father, Rian. "'You are welcome.' here in our house and our lands. I understood in an instant why such a confused old man as Gorlach should still sit on the throne. If Rian was the king's only son, as seemed likely, the hernsman might be reluctant to put a cripple on the throne unless it was absolutely necessary. Beside Rian on the bench sat a woman I took to be his wife, Cormac's mother. The lady was covered head to foot, including a cowl over her head, so that only her face showed. Her otherwise pleasant features were set in lines of what I guessed was weariness. The strange audience did not last long, and then Prince Cormac led us out again, back to the part of the large compound that seemed to be his, where we were offered food and drink. I, uh, I apologize for my grandfather's misunderstanding he said when we had been served, but my master waved it away. Many responsibilities must fall to you, Prince Cormac, Hakatri said. Can you not simply take the crown for yourself? Inaluki asked. Is that not what your people want, instead of a sickly king and a sickly heir? I thought I saw Cormac wince, and my own master clearly had to suppress a bark of annoyance at his brother's indiscretion. But the prince replied courteously, "'We do not do things so, Lord Inaluki, nor do your own folk, from what I know.' "'Such a situation does not arise among our folk,' said Inaluki, but now my master interrupted. "'We can discuss such things another time,' he said. "'But now, Prince Cormach, we must tell you what we have learned about dragons.' especially the terrible black worm that preys upon your people. The tale of our trip to Ravensperch and our days with Zaniko was a long one, made longer because the mortal prince had many questions. Like us, he had heard of the exile, but never seen him, and was struck with wonder by nearly every detail of the castle atop the beacon. But for all his helpful advice, Hakatri finished, Zaniko could not help us with the most important part. To make a great witchwood spear, to use against Hidohebi, requires a tall witchwood tree, and there are few left in the world in these diminished days. Of all the witchwood groves that once grew in the cities of our people, only those in our home and in distant Nakiga still thrive. "'Could you not find a suitable witchwood in Azua?' Cormac asked. "'Our father set, sent word that the groves of our home are forbidden to us "'unless Inaluki renounces his oath and returns to Azua. "'That does not seem likely to happen.' "'Inaluki shook his head, his face grim. "'It will not.' "'After an uncomfortable pause, the talk moved on to other things.' The worm was still snatching livestock from the hills and dales around Serpent's Vale, and more than a few Hernslanders had vanished as well, thought to have been taken by the beast. As we spoke, drinking the sour honey wine that Cormac's servant, servants brought us, one old retainer came to his master and whispered in his ear. I thought perhaps the prince was being called away, but Cormac only nodded when the old man had finished, saying, I had quite forgotten, good Dermot, but I too have heard that story. Tell our guests. The old man, who, though bald and bent and wrinkled, looked as though he could have beaten King Gorlach in a race even while carrying Prince Rion on his back, looked at us in blushing confusion. Go on, Cormac urged him. It is just, do you see, 
said the old man in a far more uncertain way than he had whispered into his lord's ear, that I am remembering, I am. His Zediah speech was a bit strange, but understandable, and I was reminded that once most mortals in this part of the Western world had grown up knowing it. <clears throat> Do not be afraid, said the prince. These lords of the Zediah want to hear what you have to say. Just that, I was remembering a tale I heard from my old gran when I was small, Dermoth said, his face still red across the cheekbones. About the Ladies Grove, the woods that was once Lady Zosha's. I know nothing of this, said Hakatri. Was it a Witchwood Grove? That I, I, I couldn't say, good master, the old servant replied. But the tale I heard was that it was a magical place, forbidden to all, full of what we call greywood trees, like what Hearn's famous spear was made from. Does it still exist? my master asked. Is it somewhere near? The man shook his head. Not near here, no. Up in the highest crags of old Whitecap is where it lies. But when Lady Zosha died, the fairy king, Inazashi, claimed it for his own. He shrugged. I know not of what happened to the greywood trees afterward. No, begging your lord's pardon. When I was young, we used to look for the grove, but never found it. They say it is close guarded by the old ones. The color, which had finally begun to drain from his cheeks, came rushing back. I beg pardon, Lord Hakatri, I mean by your folk. My master and his brother looked at each other. A witchwood gray grove on the mountain? Hakatri turned to Cormac. If it is anything more than an old story, perhaps there is yet something we can do about this murderous drake. I will not detail all that came afterward. It is enough to say that when only a few more suns had set and risen, we left the house of King Gorlach, but not alone. Prince Cormac now traveled with us, leading several of his closest companions and almost two score other retainers and men of his household. Our horses were rested, and like us had been well fed and well kept. The hernsmen learned much of their horsecraft from my master's people back in the old days, and so it should have been a light-hearted party setting out. But though my master and the mortal prince seemed in fair temper, Lord Inaluki was still sunk in a mire of brooding silence, and the prince's men, though Cormac assured us they were among the bravest Hernsland had to offer, were also quiet, and barely spoke, even among themselves. That was not hard to understand. The Zedaya lord Inazashi, whose witchwood grove we aimed to find, and plunder, had been master of the mountains and the hidden city of Silverholm since long, long before even Hernsland's old King Gorlach had been born. In fact, Inazashi was almost a, as dire a figure of myth to the mortal Hernsman as Queen Utuku was to my own folk. Further, in the servant Dermoth's old stories about the Lady's Grove, Enazashi had promised that any mortals found there would be put to death without mercy. So Cormac's men, though loyal to their prince, were clearly fearful what the days ahead might hold. I have heard much talk of late about Lady Azosha, I said to Lord Hakatri but I know little about her beyond what I have heard on this journey. Why did one of your people give her land to the mortals? Nobody knows all the story, my master told me. But Azosha was always thought strange, even by her own kin. She came to these lands, as did Inazashi and his clan, on one of the eight ships. But Azosha did not want to be ruled by her shipmates simply because they outnumbered her, so she left the landing place in the earliest days, before the city of Silverholm had been built around the ship. With her servants and retainers, for she had been an important noble in the garden, she built her own house on the high hill that was afterward called by her name, Mien Azoshai. 
There she lived as she pleased, and many of the most learned, or most unusual, of our people came to visit her. Many never left, preferring her settlement even above Tumitai, the first great city of our folk. Her house became famous for the artists and philosophers who were her guests. My master paused as his horse made its way over a fallen tree, and as he did, Cormac spoke up. Our stories say that she was a great sorceress, though not a wicked one. I am sure she seemed so, said Hakatri, smiling. And it could be that Azosha and her friends dabbled in practices that others considered strange and perilous. But for the large part, the stories I have heard describe her mostly as one who went her own way and did not pretend to care what others thought. But still, why would she give her land to the herdsmen? I asked. It seems strange that a Zediah noble should do such a thing. That is the question no one can answer, Hakatri said, though many have tried, and there have been as many ideas as there are birds in the sky. Among our people, said Prince Cormac, it is told that she fell in love with Hearn the Hunter, who was a mighty man. Again, my master smiled. Perhaps. All that is known beyond doubt is that in, is that in her last years, because Azosha, like Utuku of the Hamaka, was already old when our people fled the dying garden, she wrote a testament in her own hand that gifted her lands to the descendants of Hearn. Being mortal, Hearn had not lived to know of the gift, but her legacy was affirmed to his heirs by the Sansara Senditu, my grandmother. This was much to Lord Enazashi's disgust, as you heard from his own mouth, Pamon. Hearn's descendants, like the prince here, have lived on those lands ever since. Lady Azosha must have been very strong-minded, I said. But for some reason I was thinking of Ona of Ravensperch, the exile's wife. The odd things Lady Ona had said to me had been in my mind ever since we left the beacon. An idea could be like a seed, I was discovering, small to begin, small to begin with, but quick to grow. A person might die or be left behind, but an idea might live on and on. Our race has never been short of strong-minded females, Hakatri said, and though he laughed as he said it, he also sounded proud. But all would agree that Azosha was one of a kind. She wrote poetry, but also studied the philosophy of nature and loved to talk about it. A bard of her court once called her the mistress of uncomfortable questions, and some of her ideas still spark arguments among our wisest elders to this day. This too struck home for me. What had Lady Ona asked me about my Zadaya master? Why do you serve him? Why is he the master and you the minion? It was easy to imagine Azosha asking such questions, easy to imagine the discomfort they would have caused. As we continued up into the heights, Hakatri asked the prince, Was your grandfather surprised to find that the Zedaya had come to help? The king does not know, Cormac said. He was confused. He thought you had come from the imperator of Naban. But your grandfather was the one who sent you to Azua for help in the first place, was he not? I will tell you something, Lord Hakatri and trust your wisdom and kindness not to share it with others. These days the king of Hernsland understands very little. You've seen how his age has overtaken him. Cormac shook his head. Make no mistake, my grandfather once was a great king indeed, which is why Hernsland has grown under his rule. But he is past fourscore summers now, and his wits are all but gone. It was my father and I who decided that I should go to Azua. Then why is your father not the king? asked Inaluki. You saw his frailties, my lord. 
Cormac looked as if he did not like the question much. The chieftains would not accept my father as king. Many say the gods have cursed him with this illness. If he took the throne, many of the chieftains, especially the most powerful, would likely turn their backs on the throne and our family. There are others in our western lands who fancy themselves king, even if they do not use the title. Some of them are high-born chieftains, but some are mere prean, as we call them, crows, warlords little better than bandits. <clears throat> if they knew how utterly my grandfather's wits have wandered, or, or if my father accepted the crown in his place, they would think the throne weakened and descend like carrion birds, like the carrion birds whose name we give them plucking the kingdom to pieces, each taking a bit for himself. Things would soon be as they were before Hearn the Great. Worse even, because many of these chieftains have prospered under our leadership and have built fortified cities and powerful war bands for themselves. Then if I may ask, said my master, why do you not take the throne yourself, Cormac? Certainly, surely your father would see the sense in that. He likely would, but I would not do it while my grandfather lives. Bad enough, my father must suffer the scorn of the ignorant, who treat him like a whittling, though his mind is strong, and he is as full of wisdom as any in his line before him. The bitterness Cormac felt had become apparent on his face and his voice, and in his voice. I will not see him passed over that way. When my grandfather dies, my father will take the crown, but announce he is too unwell to rule and pass it along to me. I cannot take that dignity away from him. I thought Cormac very noble for a mortal, but could not help wondering if his determination might be wrong-headed. Surely everyone in Hernsland must already know that the old king was unfit. Such a thing was not completely unheard of even among my master's people though it was rare. My master once told me that Soniso, the first lord of Kementari, was known to have become very morose in his age and eventually descended into a, a kind of madness. But it was so uncommon that the few others to suffer that way were said to have become Soniso. We climbed the steep winding track up Old Whitecap, in the cold rain. The farther we climbed, the harder it was even to make out the path, and eventually it vanished entirely, overrun by forest. But we knew the ladies' grove was near the top, and if there was any direction that was easy to discern on those steep slopes, it was upward. So we made our way slowly as gnarled oaks and ash trees were gradually supplanted by dark evergreens. We wound around the upper reaches of the mountains until we could see most of the western side of the Sun Step range before us, and even caught an occasional glimpse of the silver sea beyond, burning like molten bronze as the sun sank back into the horizon. At last, as twilight spread across the sky, we found another track through the dripping trees, an ancient one, much overgrown. Soon we could see a place just above us where a circle of tall pines against... Sorry, let me read that again. Soon we could see a place just above us where a circle of tall pines stood against the darkening sky. I thought I could make out a deeper darkness within that circle, a dim, almost invisible core that swayed silently in the evening wind. Before this shadowy grove lay a stretch of open land, and, in the midst of that clearing, stood a large, upright stone. Unguessable years of wind and rain had worn much of its surface away. But as we approached, my master said, Those are our people's old runes. There's not enough left to read, but I think we can guess what they say. He turned to Cormac. Your men must not pass this boundary marker. I do, not, I do not doubt we have found the entrance to the Lady's Grove. Take them a little way back down the mountain, and make camp to wait for us. Cormac turned and called to his men in their own tongue. 
At his words I saw relief on all their faces, which had been very somber. I will come with you, my lords, the prince said as he watched his hernsmen turn and begin moving down the track. I thank you, Cormac, said my master, but you will not. This is for my brother and myself to do. Any blame must fall on us alone. Lord Inazashi would never dare to execute two of the Sansere, not for mere trespass. But I doubt anything would restrain him from revenging himself on you and your folk. Cormac objected to this, but after some quiet argument, my master won out. I, I pray for your success, Lord Akatri and Lord Inaluki, the prince said at last, then turned and rode after his men. He knew you would not let him come with us, said Inaluki. I think the mortal's bravery was only for show. Perhaps, Hakatri said, or perhaps you judge him too narrowly. But if you truly wish to discover the hernsman's metal, there will be ample chance later, when we return to Serpent's Vale. I wondered for a moment whether the protection my master expected for himself and his brother as Sansere would serve for me as well, but dismissed the thought as unworthy. I felt sure Hakatri would not let anything happen to me. As we passed the ancient standing stone and entered the ring grove of trees, I began to notice a new odor, as strong as the sharp, cool scent of the surrounding pines, but different. It had a spicy sweetness to it, but also something darker beneath, a whiff of wet moss combined with a a tang that I can only describe as earthy or mineral, like the scent of stony ground after the rains have come and gone. My master's folk name this odor of living witchwood Atsi, earth blood. The poet Tuya had called it one of the greatest good things, but I had never noticed it in the finished witchwood of blades or armor, which was the only sort I had encountered. It was overwhelming, climbing straight from my nose into my very thoughts. As we passed through the outer ring, the air seemed to grow damper and warmer. The noise of the wind had become entirely muted among the tall trees, and the light of the moon and stars was strained through the crowding leaves until I could barely see my own hands holding sea foam's reins. My eyes are not as sharp as those of my master and his people, but not so poor as a mortal's either. As I grew more accustomed to the darkness, I could make out a little more of the center of the grove, not only the shapes of the witchwood trunks, which were thicker and more widely rooted than the tall pines, but also the pale strands of creeper that hung everywhere in the grove, twining up the twisted pillars, dangling from branches, and stretching between trees as if Someone had haphazardly tried to bind the trunks together. The creepers were white weave, yeduame, and I am told they grow only on witchwood. The stillness and the heavy, wet air pressed on me until I found it difficult to breathe, though my master and his brother did not seem bothered. They were already examining the trees in the central ring, which surrounded an empty space that showed where the first witchwoods had been planted. I heard Hakatri and Inaluki talking quietly to each other, and the magnitude of what we were doing suddenly struck me. For the first time in my life, I was in a holy witchwood grove, but we had come as thieves, not lawful gatherers. A sudden chill ran through me. I wanted to call out to my master to hurry, but the quiet of the place pressed me to silence. My concern seemed petty almost meaningless set against the age and solemnity of the grove, but a part of me felt as if we were about to rob a sacred tomb. Until my master and Inaluki selected a tree, I had not considered the practical issues of felling one of the large witchwoods and then carrying it out of the grove. I could not see the top of the one they chose, but it was no sapling. I could not have reached my arms all the way around its trunk. While I watched over the horses, who seemed curiously calm, certainly more so than I was, 
the brothers drew out their swords, Ineluki's gleaming and my master's fabled thunderstroke, in Dreju, in the Zedaya tongue. My master once told me that I, it was a pity I did not know more about the making of a witchwood blade, since my own people had always been the masters of shaping the sacred wood. That idea was new to me, one of the many things about my own folk I had not known. I learned later that the tree's core must be pressed, hammered, and suffused with various compounds until it is flexible as well as hard, as strong as any metal. But even that night, as my master and Inaluki labored in that silent grove, I knew that shaped witchwood was stronger than the raw wood of the tree, which is why, after a great deal of work, hours of it, the two brothers were able to cut through the trunk far enough to fell the witchwood they had chosen. What now, brother? Inaluki asked as they walked up and down the length of the trunk. Will we trim it before we halt? Thieves! cried a voice from the darkness in the Zedaya tongue. Take another step, and our next flight will find your flesh. We stopped, of course. We discovered your allies down the mountain, the voice continued. They do not even know we have found their camp, though our archers surround them. Now step out, and no tricks. We can see you far better than you can see us. We do not fear you, cried Inaluki. Hakatri, as always the less combative of the two, called back. We can see you perfectly well, kinsmen. We are no mortals, though our companions on the mountainside are. Hold back your swift arrows, and we will step forward. And as he spoke, he set down his sword and spread his hands, so the hidden enemy hidden from my sight, anyway, could see them. By the garden, said the voice from the darkness in astonishment as my master stepped out into the moonlight. It is a Katri of Azua. It is. Who stands before me? asked my master. Then, like one of the spirits of the dead in an old story, a figure appeared from the shadows, taking on shape by starlight, until I could recognize an armored Zadaya holding a long war bow, his black hair worn in a horse tail. I know your face, my master said. I saw you at the sight of witness. You are Yazashi, son of Lord Enazashi. The black-haired one made a gesture of respectful greeting, but his face was stony. And you are trespassing in my father's lands. Worse, you have stolen a tree from his grove. Your father has no right to this grove, cried Inaluki. This was Lady Azusha's. Yazashi gave him a hard look. Strange to hear the scions of Azua so concerned about the rights of one long dead, and stranger still to find them stealing a witchwood tree instead of asking permission. I cannot imagine you would deal kindly with us, if our silver home folk had come to Azua's sacred grove and tried to take a tree by stealth. Are you calling us thieves? Inaluki demanded. I can think of no better word to describe what I see here. I beg you, said my master, let us sit and speak of this without threats, he turned to his brother, or angry posturing. After all, we come come from the same garden. We share the same exile. When you hear what we are doing here, Yazashi, you may feel differently. Yazashi stayed silent. Inaluki said, but my master did not give his brother a chance to argue further, silencing him with a single harsh whisper. When he turned back to the heir of Silverholm, Hakatri asked, can we speak peacefully as kinsmen? Let us leave the felled tree here and go a little apart. Perhaps we can even make a fire. I think Pamon, my armager, is feeling the cold. I almost told him he was wrong. I, I may not be as hardy as my master's folk, but neither are we Tanuka Daya as helpless as mortals. But I realized before I spoke that the reason for a fire was not important to Hakatri. 
He was not truly worrying about my comfort, but trying to change the nature of conversation from an armed deadlock to something more like a negotiation between respectful foes or even between allies. Yuzashi considered for a moment, then signaled his men to lower their bows and move back. My master and his brother, and I, of course, then went to him, leaving the fallen witchwood behind. Hakatri said, And the mortals you have surrounded are innocent. They did not enter the grove. They accompanied us up the mountain, but did not know what we planned or what we intend to do next. Yuzashi gave him an odd look, then turned and summoned one of his archers and spoke briefly. The archer slipped away. So then, Yuzashi said, we will make a fire and talk. Yuzashi's company built the fire near a standing stone, near the standing stone. The worst of the rains had passed, and only a few tattered clouds obscured the stars wheeling across the sky. My master and his brother explained what had brought them in search of a witchwood. Yazashi, as with others we had met, was full of questions about the exile Zaniko. Did he tell you to come to my father's grove for a tree to make this great spear? he demanded. Hakatri shook his head. No. He said it must be witchwood, that is all. But instead of revealing the herdsmen's stories about the grove, he only said, we learned about your father's claiming of Azosha's witchwood trees from old tales. Yuzashi was silent a long time when my master had finished. If you saw me at my father's side, you will remember that I did not want to turn you away or to ignore the peril of our neighbors, even if they are only mortals. My master nodded. I remember. But... You have put me in a hard situation. The firelight showed me Yuzashi's face clearly for the first time, and I was struck by how youthful he looked, younger than either my master or Inaluki. It is one thing for me to disagree with my father. The garden knows it is not the first time, nor will it be the last. But it would be quite another thing for me to let you take one of his trees, especially when he was already made aware that there were strangers on the mountain. But they are not his trees, said Inaluki, then turned to Hakatri. Brother, this is another bootless argument. My master did not take his eyes off Yazashi. In time, in times of great need, no one of good heart can remain indifferent. Remember, I have seen this dragon, Yazashi, and it is truly a fearful thing. It may be mortals who are most threatened by it now, but ultimately we of the Dawn children will be in terrible danger as well. All you need to do to help us fight this scourge is to turn a blind eye. Yazashi laughed, but it sounded sour. Turn a blind eye? My father does not turn a blind eye to anything that belongs to him. He will ask me what I discovered here on the mountain. I will not lie to him. Bootless, muttered Inaluki. But my father is not as cold and pitiless as you might think him from our audience, Yazashi continued. It is just that the arrival of the mortal hernsman turned his mind to old grievances. He is not always so hard-minded. I do not doubt it, said Hakatri. Still, here we sit in middle night, waiting for your decision. I could see that my master's temper was strained, caught as he was between his brother and Enizashi's son. There seemed no common ground to be found, but instead of arguing, Hakatri only lifted a stick and poked at the fire until sparks leaped up and swirled away into the night. It is not as though the tree can be replanted now that it has been felled, Yuzashi spoke slowly, as though listening to how his own words sounded. Neither can I imagine trying to drag the scions of Year Dancing House back to Silverholm in chains. You could not, said Inaluki. It would be a crime against the garden itself. I beg you to be quiet and listen, brother. Speak on, Yuzashi. 
The balance beam is overhead, he said at last. The constellation of mercy. In this confusing hour, I will let the sky advise me. He extended his hands in the sign of judgment. The witch wood has been felled. That cannot be undone. But in my father's eyes, it is a crime that cannot be ignored. He lifted a hand as a call for silence, though my master did not seem as though he meant to speak. Perhaps Yazashi meant to forestall more angry, angry words from Inaluki. Therefore, I release the tree to you, to be used against the dire beast Hirohebi. But afterward, whatever may happen, I charge you to come back to my father's court and tell him what you told me. And what if your father declares it a crime? demanded Inaluki. He is no more likely than me to strike a blow at Year Dancing House, I think, said Yazashi carefully. But nothing can be certain. That is my judgment, and only with that provision can I let you walk away from the grove tonight. Hakatri gave his brother a warning look, then said, We agree. I thank you for your generosity and forbearance. You have my word we will return to ask your father's forgiveness. Yazashi seemed amused. If you forgive, expect forgiveness, I think you may be disappointed. My father is seldom that way disposed. But I salute your courage in risking your lives for the good of others. Hakatri made a gesture of gratitude. We will not forget this. Then go and summon your mortal helpers, because I do not think you will be able to carry the tree down the mountain without them. Yazashi stood. My company and I will leave now, both because I do not want to linger long enough to regret my decision, and because I must prepare for the unenviable task that you two have shirked, telling my lord and father what happened here and what I decided. Yazashi led his men away. When only my master, his brother, and myself remained, Hakatri stood. Let us get to work. There is much to do. And that's where we're going to stop at two minutes after eight. And I hope everybody is still attached. I forget, forgot to go back and check. Um, yes, okay. Um, Jack asks, is the Indreju uh, that Hakari owns the same, Hakatri owns the same one used by Jiriki? Yes. It is, in fact, Indreju, which means either Thunderstroke or Thunderbolt in Sithi, in Zidaya, is, in fact, the same one um, that came to, uh, that came to um, Hakatri, came to Jiriki through his family. And, um, but we will hear more about the family and other things later on. Anyway... Thank you so much for joining me. As always, it's a huge pleasure to be able to hang out with y'all and read and do stuff like that. And especially in the midst of a lot of other craziness, it's nice to have a bit of normality. I will be back next week um, for the, um, whatchamacallit, for the same 7 o'clock, sorry, 1 a.m. and 7 p.m. readings. Um, I will, if anything changes, of course, it'll be on my social media. If not, expect much the same and more of the same and things like that there so with that i say thank you so much be good to yourself be good to your your family and your loved ones and your friends and neighbors help other people out that's how we will all get by and i will talk to you very soon thanks peace